just getting here. We try to get here a little bit early, but it just seems like we run into um, issues all along. But we want to start open today with the word of prayer. And um, would um, uh, Melinda, would you open us in a word of prayer this morning? Yes. <clears throat> Father, thank you so much for this day. Thank you for fresh mercies. Thank you for your grace, for your love. And, and uh, Lord, we know that you're already here with us. So we just ask you to rise up big in our midst today. And we're ready to receive as a family what you have for us. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Uh, we have a wonderful guest this morning, uh, but before we get started with uh, our guest, before we introduce him, um, we want to share with you some of the wonderful things that we had going on uh, over the last week. Um, our, our dad and I, we got a chance to travel to um, uh, Dallas, and we had a, just a fantastic time there uh, with with um, the at the conference called Mosaic Conference, and uh, I'll let me share some pictures with you because pictures are just really worth a thousand words. We were at the Mosaic Fifth National Conference, and JP he was the final speaker there. We went on Tuesday uh, and came back on Friday. And, uh, and you know, uh, the goat, we call, we call him JP the goat. Uh, he still has it in him to, to really, um, do a, just a wonderful, um, uh, message. He was the uh, final speaker. As I said, we were able to see old friends, um, new friends, Mark DeMoz. He, he is the head of the Mosaic conference, uh, David Anderson, um, as, most of you know him from our Bible study here. He's spoken uh, several times here. And um, uh, we got to see uh, old friends and new friends. Um, Soon Chan, who has spoken here, uh, Michael Emerson, uh, you know, Dur maybe you know Duran Gray. Um, he's spoken to Hottie Lewis, who is going to be coming on. Um, and uh, he's with, uh, he, he did a film called Juneteenth. And, uh, and then we got a chance to meet some of our, uh, the staff from one of our, uh, Perkins Legacy Schools, Wesley Seminary, and uh, that was just uh, a, uh, just an enjoyable time just to always catch up with people from the different schools. Uh, and, and the closing session was so powerful. The, the whole conference was just great. Uh, it's just a um, time where uh, God is just moving in the uh, multi-ethnic church movement. Um, and, uh, and at the closing session, Dr. David Anderson gave just a powerful prayer. They laid hands on on JP, and uh, it, the the scene there is just uh, is just you know you can just almost feel the the um, Holy Spirit uh, there in that photo. And then um, uh, after that conference was ended, we got a chance to um, go uh, with. And, and visit Dr. Tony Evans. And uh, th on the way over there, it was, uh, we had a, a, in the drive over, a meeting before the meeting. And uh, that's what we call this. And wouldn't you like to be a, a, a fly on the wall of these two great um, uh, men of faith? Um, uh, they call them giants uh, in the faith. And just to hear their conversation, you know, I, you know, and I, and Elizabeth and I, we, we're just, we were, we're, we're just honored to be able to just listen to um, them uh, have conversation together. And, and uh, it's just amazing what um, they will talk about and, and the personal things that they talk about, just the history. You know, um, I had no, we had no idea all the things that uh, JP has done to um, introduce Tony to um, the world stage, and I had no idea, you know, and, uh, and, uh, and so it's, um, I, and Tony has just taken things uh, to a whole nother level in, um, in, in, in ministry, and so we just feel so proud of him, and, uh, and then we went to their urban alternative um, uh, 
I guess, compound. They have a empire over there. Uh, and uh, and they did an interview and uh, we got a chance to spend the, just the afternoon over there with them. And uh, they the interview was supposed to be 30 minutes and it ended up being three or four hours. And uh, it was just fantastic just to hear the, uh, their entire history. And uh, they have it all on tape. And we had lunch with them and their staff. And uh, so that was just um, a wonderful thing. So uh, we're just, uh, that, that was that was our week. We got home at, uh, about 10.30. Well, no, it was about midnight again. So uh, we had a long uh, time. And so, but another thing I want to do is um, ask hey, you- can I, can I say something first? It was, it was a smart meeting too, because what Tony did was, he got everything he wanted to get out of daddy on, on tape. And so CJ and all of y'all other pastors, y'all need to have your meeting with daddy and get it on tape and on video. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, I guess that they're, they're saying, uh, JP, you may, uh, you, you, like you said, you might have one foot in the grave <laughs> and uh, they want to get everything on tape before, before your time, time uh, comes. So, um, we're just just thankful for the, for that opportunity. So, um, uh, is, any other announcements? Um, I want to uh, actually have um, you all pray for our Perkins Fellows on the campus of University of Virginia at Charlottesville. Um, they are coping with uh, the death of uh, three of their um, uh, students and um, and two of them who are in the hospital after a shooting there. And um, they had a vigil and uh, different things. And um, I spoke to the leader of their um, of the Perkins Fellows there, and and it's a difficult time for students to to just be locked in lockdown and in fear, and um, and they should not have to go through that. So um, keep them in in your prayers. Um, right now, uh, JP, you want to uh, say anything about uh, CJ before I do, because I'm gonna do a little introduction of him as well. Okay, okay. yeah. CJ was a part of the original revisiting of my this Bible class when it was being met in the home before the pandemic hit. So we had already approved of him. He he is the direction, he's the objective of our direction in which we is going to pass it on to Dr. Van Art. We want to pass on what we have learned during my 92 years and your life and our life together. We want to carry that discussion on and, and, and y'all want to improve on it. And it's this generation, it's this generation that we are uh, uh, talking about. And that's what, one of the reasons I did not want to end this angry discussion. Uh, pro-life, what is life? We sell that and you're gonna sell it this morning too because life is love. You got an unending subject. Life is love. Life is God. I am the way, I am the truth, I am the life. And so we take it that life belongs to God and resurrected life show what he can do with life. It shows what he can do with life. So we are just absolutely proud of your church. We're proud of the way you're doing it, going down to all cone and making certain that a generation of black and multicultural people know this wonderful truth as you know this truth. So we honor you. We honor, I honor your father by being on the forefront of life movement in turn of the civil rights movement in Mississippi and justice. So we admire you, I admire you. So we wanted to, of course, as we leave this scene, we wanna see people like y'all go on. So the light to you, brother. Amen. Amen. Uh, well, um, I just want to say that uh, 
CJ, he is pastor of the historic Mount Helm uh, Baptist Church. And it is, uh, and he will tell you uh, one of the, it is the oldest black church in Mississippi, I think. But he'll tell you about, about that. And um, he graduated from, um, he has a, a, his, he went to seminary at Duke Divinity School. And uh, he got his PhD at Wesley Seminary here in Jackson um, and his doctorate of ministry at Wesley. And, uh, and he has two beautiful boys who are eight right now. That's a, a little bit older picture and uh his wife uh allison and him they um uh, and in the baptist church i guess you would call her first lady huh um uh and so um she is uh uh they have a wonderful family and we are just so happy to have um uh, uh cj here this morning with us and to share with us the uh, the first part of our three-part series on faith hope and love and he's going to be doing the first part which is love part. And uh, so CJ, um, tell us a little bit about yourself more than, um, and correct me on all the things that I may have made a mistake on. And, uh, and um, you can get into your uh, sharing. Well, grace and peace be unto you from God, our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Great morning to everyone. It is an honor and a privilege to be here. I am uh, Peacock proud, hyena happy to be able to share this space. I have great, great respect and honor for uh, uh, Dr. and uh, Mrs. Perkins and the Perkins family. Very, very grateful for uh, your work and witness in, in Jackson and throughout the nation and world and um, humbled particularly, uh, Dr. John, by your, your words earlier. Um, uh, Mount Helm is the oldest African-American congregation in Jackson, and one of the oldest in Mississippi. Um, one of the other or two kind of really cool notes about uh, Mount Helm is that Mount Helm, uh, one, was the campus for what is now known as Jackson State University from 1883 to 1885. Uh, and then another big note is that the Church of God in Christ uh, has its origin story at Mount Helm. And we actually celebrated 125 years uh, this year of the emergence of the Holiness Revival uh, that was led by Charles Price Jones, our fifth pastor, who, um, of, of course, was alongside uh, Charles Harrison Mason, uh, the leader of that revival. And, and that's a unique uh, piece of the story because uh, Dr. John uh, experienced the Lord in a Church of Christ Holiness Church out in California. Uh, and that, that movement began uh, in the city of Jackson and began at Mount Helm Church. Uh, and also a native, I'm a native of Hillshurst, Mississippi. So I'm a country boy. I may be cosmopolitan now, but I'm from the country. Uh, fried green tomatoes, collard greens, neck bones, all that kind of stuff. So a uh, wonderful uh, morning to you. I want to go ahead and get started. I do have a break away here in a little bit. I'm actually on the Mississippi Gulf Coast for our uh, Mississippi Baptist State Convention uh, meeting. And uh, but I did want to make time to be here because when Dr. John asks you to do something, you do it. Um, I'm here to talk about love based on 1 Corinthians 13, and I want to begin with a quote I actually stumbled upon this morning uh, from Deion Sanders, aka or BKA, Coach Prime. He says, um, there are many definitions of love from man's perspective, but God is love. We can debate all day about love, but if we're not seeing any attributes of God, is that really love? Love is not dysfunctional, nor does it provoke division. Love brings us closer and keeps us there. Love brings us closer and keeps us there. I think that's a wonderful way of framing and understanding what the Holy Spirit leads the Apostle Paul to write about in 1 Corinthians 13. I wanna lift up just a few verses for the sake of brevity. Uh, from 1 Corinthians 13, uh, rendered this way in the NKJV. Though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels, but have not love, I become sounding brass or a clanging cymbal. Though I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and though I have all faith, 
so that I could remove mountains, but have not love, I am nothing. And though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, and though I give my body to be burned, but have not love, it profits me nothing. Verse eight, love never fails. But whether there are prophecies, they will fail. Whether there are tongues, they will cease. Whether there is knowledge, it will vanish away. For we know in part, we prophesy in part, but when that which is perfect has come, then that which is in part will be done away. Um, this chapter on love is often used and in wedding ceremonies as a description of the kind of love husband and wife ought to have for one another. But in the original context of 1 Corinthians, the book and 1 Corinthians 13, the chapter, this is not really about a wedding, but about our witness as the body of Christ. There are many members, but one body, one body, but many members. And Paul is addressing a major concern explicitly here in 1 Corinthians 13, but implicitly throughout the entire book. He is calling the saints, which is the language he uses in chapter one, that these persons are called to be saints. He's calling the saints up, not simply calling them out. And he's calling them up to love. I mean, a distinction because we live in a day where we like to call people out, we like to cancel folk who don't agree with us. And maybe for good reason, we, we have concerns about vitriolic uh, speech or various actions. But what Paul begins, I believe, uh, to do in chapter one is give an aspirational approach to his, his uh, calling, his commandment. He, he understands they are called to be saints, that they have a higher life in God. That is what Charles Price Jones did, for instance, at Mount Helm Church when he came and said that he wanted God's people to have a greater life in the spirit, to have victory in Jesus, to not live beneath their birthright in God. And so he called them to a higher life, a higher standard, not in a way that condemned them, but in a way that said this life is, is possible because Christ has come that we might have life in that more abundantly. Paul is calling us to aspire to live out our sainthood, not waiting for that to be beatified or ratified at some later date, but that right now we are both by position and in progress, saints of God. We are sanctified, set apart from the world and therefore must not act like the world, which one could argue uh, this distinction is the world hates, but the church, the kingdom loves because ultimately God is love. God doesn't just have love. God is love. And therefore, those who are of God, belong to God, have been born again through God, must also demonstrate love. Love is, in the words of Dr. John, the final fight. It is the, it is the substratum. It's the, it's the foundation. It is, it is the floor. It, 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 is, it is the basement. It is the foundation of all that we are and do. And by the time he gets to chapter 13, he is engaged in helping these saints understand the ways in which they have not practiced love. And there are a few reasons that I identify in 1 Corinthians, which is one of my favorite uh, uh, books of the Bible, by the way, uh, that are uh, de demonstrations of, of a lack of love. One of the sure proofs that you lack love Paul says, is if there is division in what should it be should be unified. Many members, but one body. And that this one body in Christ ought to demonstrate unity. And where there is disunity, the root of that is a lack of love, a lack of love for God, love for neighbor or other, and dare I suggest, even a lack of love for self. So how does this show up in the Corinthian congregation? Well, there are at least three particular forms of division that we see in the book of First Corinthians, and I think we see it show up in the body of Christ today. There is, if you will, the division around intellectualism, right? So Paul, for instance, is addressing this leadership tribalism uh, where some people love Paul, some love Apollos, some love Peter. Um, people are kind of having partisan loyalties, right, uh, based on their preferences. And one of those partisan loyalties is based on intellectualism. 
that there were some in the Corinthian congregation who liked Apollos as a preacher because uh, Apollos was eloquent, elegant, articulate, wise, uh, one would say maybe philosophical. And, and in the church, there are those who, who lean in that direction. I call those people, if you will, our word people. They are the ones who believe in seminary and commentaries and exegesis and, and, and sermons that sort of are like essays or lectures. And if you don't meet that standard, they don't believe that you are truly called and commissioned. They, they are more heady, more intellectual, more rational, more reasonable. And so they gravitate toward people who demonstrate a kind of cultured, refined, dignified, intelligent ministry. But then there's another group of folks that, that Paul identified because Paul wants to make sure he gets everybody, right? He's not pointing fingers at just at one group. He's looking at all of the divisions in, in the body of Christ at Corinth. And so he says, there are those who are divided along the lines of intellectualism, but then there are those who are divided along the lines of charismaticism. There are those in the church who say, we may not have all the wisdom and knowledge and understanding that these folk over here do, but we have the gifts of the spirit. We perform the supernatural. We can heal. We can speak in tongues. We, we can see phenomenal things happen. And so, and so we see that there and even today where some folks say, you know, the seminary is the cemetery. I don't need all that learning. Just give me the burning. Uh, these are not necessarily just word people. These are spirit people. The, the, these are fire people. These are people who believe that, that you haven't had church unless there's a move of God that ends in an altar call, that ends in people being slain in the spirit. And Paul wants to chasten them to say that you were not superior simply because you move and operate in these ways, because ultimately these are not your gifts, as it were. You didn't conjure them up. The spirit sovereignly distributed these gifts to the body. And then there's a third group that, that he identifies before he really takes a longer time to deal with this sort of charismatic piece. And that's what I would call materialism or Epicureanism. That is to say that there are those in the body of Christ at Corinth who are not necessarily deep intellectuals or deep spiritual people. They're still kind of carnal. They're still on the, on the milk of the word. They're still getting caught up in sexual immorality, showing favoritism. They're showing up to communion, eating uh, and, and drinking and being merry and getting drunk at communion at the Eucharist. Uh, uh, sidebar, I remember having grown up in the Baptist church and, and later uh, even uh, uh, growing in ministry in the Pentecostal Charismatic Church, that we only did Welch's grape juice for communion. It wasn't until I got to Duke that I recognized that other folk used wine, like real, real wine. And, 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 and they had to drink it all up. And folk would line up at the end of service because they wanted to make sure they got every last drop of that red wine. And, and, and Paul is dealing with the carnality of some who, who claim to walk in the spirit but, but deny the Spirit's power. And we see that even in the church today, those who are nominally Christian, particularly in a state like Mississippi, who maybe show up to church every now and again, but don't, but, but, but the church isn't in them. Christ isn't really in them. It's sort of just kind of passing time. And what Paul identifies is that all three of these groups of people are demonstrating something that is very, very deep and deadly, that they are lacking love first for God and for neighbor and for self. So he turns his attention to love in a very profound way in chapter 13, which is actually a part of a longer uh, story or, or narrative about Paul correcting the abuses of the charismata. He begins in chapter 12 to define a number of the gifts of the spirit. Then in chapter 13, it's sort of the, the sort of middle ground between that and going forward in terms of of, of, of sort of remedying these sort of tensions between prophecy and tongues and says, look, y'all, at the end of the day, it begins and ends with love. And he says something very profound that ought to really make a lot of us pause. He says, essentially, in summary, in those first few verses, I can do all these wonderful things for God, but not really love God and not really mean much to the things of God, right? If, if love is the foundation, if love is the root, if, if we summarize the law and the prophets by the royal law, love God with everything you've got and love your neighbor as yourself, 
then if we are absent of love, I don't care how many souls get saved under your ministry, I don't care how many seminaries are built, I don't care how many churches or cathedrals are erected. He said, I don't even care if you give all your money away so that you can uh, 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 yeah, re remedy poverty in the world. I don't care if you give your body to be burned. If you do it sans love, if you do it without love, it means nothing. Mm. Mm. I can hear um, I can hear Jesus having this conversation in Matthew with his disciples, saying to them, "What you have done unto the least of these, you've done it even unto me." What do you mean? When when were you ever, you know, sick or in prison or thirsty or, or naked? He says, "The least of these among me, among you, these are, if you will, the images of me in the world." How you treat those, watch this, who can't do anything for you is a true demonstration of how much love we have. He says, essentially, in terms of the great judgment, that when it's all said and done, I don't care if you have preached and prayed and prophesied and spoken in tongues and healed bodies and healed the sick, all this. He says, he says, depart from me, you workers of iniquity, for I did not know you. What a, what a great and tragic Thing to hear that we do all this stuff in the name of God, in the name of Christ, in the name of ministry. But if we lack love, Paul is saying that it is meaningless, that there has to be a way in which we understand this, this deep love ethic. It, it, is, it, is, it is from this sense of love, first of all, that we understand who God is. If God is love, then we cannot not love. I know that's a double negative, but hear, hear what I'm trying to say, that, that you cannot say you belong to God. How can you say that you belong to God and yet you do not love when God is love? That there is no way that, that, you can, that you can have a relationship with the Lord and not love. It, it reminds me of a song we sing in many of our African-American churches where it talks about the Holy Spirit working within us. It says, he makes me love my enemies and even love my friends. Jesus, Jesus gives us a hard saying. There's a lot of stuff that Jesus said in those red letters that we often debate about. But one thing he says, I think, really messes up all of us when Jesus says, you've done good when you love someone who can love you back. You truly have demonstrated godly love when you can love your enemy. I don't know. So if we, as the body of Christ in America today, have really gotten to that place, as we call each other out, as opposed to call each other up, we're really in many ways saying it's hard for us to love our enemy, love the person we think is trying to do us harm. But that is when you really understand this deep, divine love, this love all exhaling, all wonderful. Paul says, in fact, all these things will pass away. Tongues, they'll cease. Knowledge, all this stuff will be gone. But what will remain will be love. It, it, is, it is love, if you will. If God is love and there's no beginning or ending to God, then therefore there is no beginning or ending to love. God is love. Love is God. Love is the binder of the universe. Love is what holds the world on its axis. Love is what flung the stars in space. Love is what breathed through the nostrils of the first man and pulled from his side his wife. Love is what continue to help us see new mercies morning by morning it it is it is love it is for it is it is for this love for god so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth upon him shall not perish but have everlasting life it is it is this love that this hesed love this covenantal love this agape love this love that won't leave us that ought to motivate and drive everything we do but it's not enough to say that we love God who we have not seen if we do not love our neighbor who we see every day. Jesus poses a question, doesn't he? Who is your neighbor? Who is worthy of your love? Who is the object of your love? And essentially, uh, Dr. John, I believe he answers it, answers it this way. Everybody. <laughs> he gives a cosmopolitan universal answer. Every human being created in the image and likeness of God is your neighbor. Therefore, do unto them as you would want done to you. So the question is, is rhetorical in some way for you this morning. What who is your neighbor? And and you know here's here's the thing I think God often does, uh Elizabeth. God will often um test us in our neighbor love by providing us a neighbor that ain't too likable. That, that sometimes there's someone on the job in the family in the church that just will get on your last nerve and you've got to say lord 
help me love them. It's important to understand that that love here is not sentimentality. It's not butterflies in the stomach. It's not, it, it, it's not all of that. We, we've often confused it in that way. And therefore, if we don't have those feelings, we say, well, I'm not obligated to love them. But, but love is more about commitment, about connection, about covenant, about compassion. It's about recognizing that at the end of the day, I can love the humanity in you because you share in the Imago Dei. Some theologians would argue that, that it's important to know that the Imago Dei, the image of God, is not most known in an individual, but in the collectible, in the collective, that, that, that male and female, he created them in the image of God, that, that in some ways as Ubuntu, this this wonderful tradition out of South Africa says that I am because we are. This covenantal connection, this umbilical cord, this interconnectivity, this interrelationship that I cannot be all I am until you all, you all, you are. Which means then that that uh, if I can go here, that justice is the logical end of love. I cannot say I love you if I don't want the best for you. I cannot say I love you if I don't want you to be able to be well-fed, well-educated, well-traveled, et cetera, so that you can have a life that flourishes, that you can have a life of shalom, nothing lacking, nothing missing, nothing broken, that my heart ought to break because you lack something that is available to all humanity. Love, in the words of Cornell West, is, or just as rather, is what love looks like in public. So I'm thankful for the legacy of John and Vera May Foundation that reminds us every day, because I love to say, man, I love you, brother, I love your sister. We're not willing to relocate and reinvest and, and rejuvenate uh, communities and people who have often felt benighted and on the underside of history and whose backs are against the wall. That the true measure of our love, James says, is not what we do for those who are in the highest esteem, but for those who are seemingly at the bottom. He says, your faith without works is dead. Your love without demonstration is mere words. If I land the plane here when I say not only are we to love God and love neighbor, the reality is that many of us cannot really love God the way we ought to and love neighbors because we don't really love ourselves. And I've come to recognize that much of the difficulties and contentions in life, in relationships, in ministries, in nations and governments, fundamentally are rooted in the lack of self-love. And that I don't mean some kind of selfish, um, self-centered, uh, curved inward, narcissistic love. I mean this genuine understanding that even as we are sinners, we are also saved by grace and we are chased after by a God who relentlessly loved us so much, not only to create us, but to call us a wholeness. I think, I think about, for instance, in my own community, many of us don't have a, a deep origin story. We can't trace our origins back to figure out if we're Fulani or Asante or Yoruba. And there, there are others who say, well, you know, I'm born into this particular situation. I'm in the trailer park. Uh, I'm, with, I'm in this place. I'm in that place. And a lot of times when we don't know who we are and love who we are, it's easy for us to then blame others and beat down on others and fall into destructive patterns of behavior. That can be seen, by the way, not only among poor people, but middle class people, rich people, white collar crimes, blue collar crimes, you know, drug addictions, all kinds of things I think are born out of this sense that we don't truly love ourselves as we ought to love mm -hmm. ourselves because in some mm -hmm. deep and abiding way, we may argue that we are not enough. That we've got to do one more thing to get God's attention. We've got to do one more thing to prove to people that we're not as bad as we claim to be or others claim us to be. Very often it's hard for us to love others until we have spent some time alone to love ourselves, the complexity of ourselves, the, 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 the brokenness of ourselves, the, the healing that's available to us in, in God. I'm, I'm really blown away. Um, and I, close here uh, by the story of the temptations of Jesus, that Jesus is pushed by the spirit into the wilderness. And there for 40 days, he fasts. And at the end of his fasting, the devil shows up and gives him three opportunities 
uh, to commit idolatry, to, to worship him, to submit, to surrender to him. And Jesus turned down all those temptations. Yes, because he is the son of God, the second person of the Trinity. He's the word made flesh. I also think there's something else that particularly um, the, the, the arrangement in the synoptics uh, provide, that, that the wilderness happens after the baptism. We all know what happens at the baptism. The heavens are rendered open and the voice of the father is shouted loud, behold, this is my son in whom I am well pleased. May I submit to you one interpretation of that is that before Jesus performs any miracles, does any teachings, before he raises the dead, before he feeds the multitudes, before he even goes to the cross, is crucified, died and is buried and is risen on the third day with all authority in his hand, the Father declares from heaven, I already love you. You already are enough. Before you do anything for this redemptive story, I love you as you are. I think we as the people of God hmm. who've been translated from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of God's dear son need to know right now that we are saved by grace through faith and not according to our works and that there's nothing we can do today or tomorrow that can make us God, make God love us any more or any less, that you are enough to receive God's love. And when you are a recipient of God's love, you do not become a reservoir of God's love, but a river of God's love that flows, uh, if you will, vertically heavenward, and also horizontally towards your neighbor. Who is my neighbor? My neighbor is the person next to me. My neighbor is the person in my neighborhood. The neighbor is the person across the nation. My neighbor is that Democrat, that Republican that votes different from me. My neighbor is that person in the, uh, in, in the school that has a different complexion, a different culture. My neighbor is someone, watch this, who doesn't even truly believe what I believe. My neighbor is someone in the different denomination and across uh, uh, even another religious body. I've got to demonstrate love because I can love because the song says, oh, how I love Jesus because he first loved me. You've truly been loved by God. It's contagious. You have no hindrance to love other people and to love God back. And so may we be known as disciples, not by the books we write, not by the speeches or sermons we declare, not by the seminaries we attend, not by the buildings we build or the Communities we serve, but may they know that we are Christians by our love. By our love. God be the glory. Amen. Amen. You are, you are saying love is the beginning and love is the final fight. What, what a beautiful beauty it is this morning. This very morning that we could hear from you. I, I, I think that as we go through this, Dr. Van der Art, and come to the end of our day, we're trying to create a time limit during this time in which we are living. And, and we want to do a, a finish up of our lives together. But boy, it would be great for you to come back. Mm -hmm. You know, you can come back many times you wanna, but I'm talking about come back with the idea of love. You know, you know, love at the beginning, love at the end, and you started to love finality. You know, finality. We've been doing it all the time, but then have you back again, like a reviewer. At some point, and because this is what we got to do. That's what she's putting out. This is somebody else want to talk. Do you? You can go when you when you have to go, but in a, give give people yes, a sir. chance to ask yep. a question. Yeah, he had he had five, first, five minutes. Go ahead. Yeah, I would love to be back, and then yeah, I got a few minutes left for questions. If anyone has a burning question they want to ask, yeah. Any questions out there? It's not a question. It's just more a challenge to all of us that our task is to love. 
and that's the most important thing we can do. Yes, yes. Thanks, Dave. Yeah. yeah. Well, I have a question. Oh, I'm sorry, Venetia. I just wanted to say hallelujah, CJ. Thank you. Yes, yes. So much. Um, my heart was Bless burning. You. Who, who is that? I'm sorry. This I can't is, see this is right Marcia. Now. This is oh. Marcia Reed. Okay, Marcia. Yeah. Okay. okay. And, and just so many of, of what you said, uh, I really love the end, you know, that God said he was well pleased with Jesus before he did anything. In, you know, since he already lived a spotless life, of course, but but just to know deep in our hearts, no matter whether we came from a home that's loving and kind and, and, and helpful, or we came from a terrible situation, that God loves us. And then to accept that uh, is pretty, it's transformational. And it's the only way, I believe you're right, that we can love anybody else. So I just thank you for the lesson this morning. Mm -hmm. yeah. Go ahead, folks. Ask if, oh, CJ. Tiffany, Tiffany un unmute yourself, Tiffany. You have a question? Yes. Um, you said that, that um, love is the logical end or that justice is the logical end to love. So I just want to hear your feedback on in, in certain places, streams of the church where social justice seems to be like a, a curse word or something to resist or something for the other people. Can you speak into that? Why, why is that? Uh, did he have to, did he, uh, did he have to leave? Maybe he had to, maybe he had to leave. Uh, cause he was, he was at a conference. If, let's see. Think he got. We we're gonna get him back. We're gonna okay. get him back at some point. Maybe Dr. Perkins, you could try to answer that question a little bit. I, I didn't hear the question. Why is there so much resistance to social justice in the church? I hope I did the question justice. Right, right. I'm. This is the way I do it. Just like he done it there. Love is in all, through all, over all. That is, there is something in the Bible about another spirit. And it seemed like that another spirit is named off in the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eye, and the pride of life. Why am I asking this question? Why am I asking this question? I think that's a legitimate question, you, you know, for me to ask, why am I questioning love? What do I have to hide? I know what it is for me. I know what it is. It's my over focus on myself. Yeah. My thing is over focus on myself. There are things that most of the time I love more than I love God. I'm glad that God is making me conscious of that before he take me home. Hmm. <clears throat> so, so the exaltation of self, righteousness is love. Righteousness is all of God living in us. Right, righteousness is Galatians 2.20. I've been crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live, yet not I, but Christ lives in me. And the life that I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith and the grace of the Son of God, who, and hope, who loved me, who loved me and gave himself for me. The, so uh, the Christian life is the outliving of the in living Christ. Jesus paid it all, all to him I owe. Sin have left John Perkins, a crunch and stain, a mixed up guy. But boy, he came to forgive me. He came to forgive me. And remember you broken. You remember he broke broken. When nothing else could help. Love lifted me. Uh, 
Okay, boy, boy, you have a question or comment? Unmute yourself, boy. I had a, a I had a reply to that question. Uh, I'm a white, 82 year old guy, uh, born in Texas, Pasadena, Texas, which is one of those sundown towns. But <clears throat> my grandmother, who was a great I mean, a big racist uh, never had to teach me because there were no African-Americans in our town. And uh, so when I got to Georgia Tech, I was able to attend Dr. King's church one time and got to he hear him and his father both preach on the same Sunday which was <laughs> a long service. That's not the point here though. The point is we moved to East End Richmond, right in the poverty area and joined the East End Fellowship which Dr. Perkins helped start with Don Coleman. And uh, my life has turned upside down. That was 10 years ago and because I didn't really understand injustice in the racism problem. And, and our lives are just completely changed. That was in 2010. So for 12 years, I've been learning over, over, over what African-Americans face and other minorities. But, uh, Wow, I wish every white man could experience living in a poverty area for a while and have their lives changed in that way. So that's my answer to that question. You, you answered the question that I'm answering at the end of my life. Uh, uh, what is it? the stone that the builders rejected. I began to see that part of that was discrimination whenever it came in making white people another image, making white folk superior and black folk inferior and that we bought into that. Now we are blind. We don't like white folks too well. We don't think white folks have been good enough to us. The idea is that we've got to love us both at the same time. And that's where the love your neighbor is. We got to love each other and we got to come out front. We got to come out front. I got to call you brother. Look what God done for you. Look what racism had done for you. It has made you not look at image as being a reflection of God. And each time I look at a human being, I'm seeing a reflection of God. So, 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 so what you are doing is giving a testimony. What you're doing is giving a testimony, and you're giving a testimony of how difficult it is. And you got the solution. I believe that Good Samaritan parable is the parable to the solution to life. I think there's others thoughts that that gives life meaning, and that the coming of Jesus Christ to redeem us so that we can inherit the kingdom. Inherit the kingdom. So I, I and, and, and that's why I separate, but on Ica is a oxymoron. And the last words he used is love gets us together. Love gets us together. And love is altogether the summa of human thought. 
for God so loved the world. He thought of the world and, and creating man in the world before he even thought of man. But God was the motivation for the existence of this creation. Oh Lord, have mercy. The depth of love is unfinite out. He is the seed of our wisdom. He is, should be the direction of our affection. That's hard for me. That's hard for me. I have, to, I have to keep on confessing those sin that I had and I didn't tell nobody about them. And I want us, if we can, to go out like that. I want my girl to keep thinking about that. I want my friend to keep thinking about that. And, and that's this time the Vanna Art and I have spent together in thinking together is so meaningful. And then to have girl, girl y'all are the one who found Rogue and, and brought him on. You, you know, I don't know if there's any special thing about that, but this morning was was a was a mind for thought. Go ahead. I've said what I can say about that. Um, Patricia, your hand is up. Can you unmute yourself? I mean, Dr. V. <laughs> Hello, everybody. Good morning. Um, from Cleveland. Uh, I just have a question with all the wisdom in the room. Uh, one of the things I've been kind of meditating on, I think even today, asking God for wisdom. So this word was so good. Um, you know, I feel like in my Christian life, I have endeavored to move as close as I can to a place of humility and, and laying myself down and emptying of self and all this. My question for people in the room, like who just may have a testimony of this, or I think I find myself trying to learn from the Lord. How do you lovingly set boundaries? <laughs> so I feel like in trying to definitely love well and be humble, I struggle with when are you passive? When are you, you know, too passive? Like, how do you lovingly set boundaries, you know, in your life? Because um, I feel like some of the things that I, that are in front of me, the big struggle is like, wow, it feels like this contradicts with all the things we're talking about. Like love never recording a suffer wrong. It doesn't, you know, look for its own way and all this. Um, but then in life, sometimes you, and then this is important for me, but also I'm raising two girls who I'm like, you, I want to exemplify setting healthy boundaries in your life as well, because some people have ill intent when you try to do that. And I, I think I, for so long, just kind of said, well, the Lord is my defender and, and I never have to defend myself for whatever, but I feel like I'm in definitely a place where I'm just like, man, am I too passive? But I want to love, you know? So I'm just curious if folks have wisdom that is that big conundrum in Christian life that we want to empty ourselves. We want to be passive. We want to turn the other cheek. We want to give them the cloak and all of the things. I mean, that I feel like I've been committed to that now I'm like, Lord, how do I find that right operation to then at the same time when necessary, stand up for myself for, you know? So I hope that makes sense. I'm just, but, but that, I haven't really been taught that. <laughs> I don't think that's I- That's sort of the reason, the quick, and I'll let somebody else ask. That's sort of the reason for this Bible class is to invite others like you into the conversation. L listen in the Bible, it says at one time that when brothers and sisters get together in discipleship, God himself picks up a stroll and begin to write what they are talking about so he won't forget it. So 
the need for others in our discipleship life to help us through these dark periods of our life and to know there is a God of light that, that, that darkness can't put out, to know there is a God of light. And, and, and we got to sing that unto you. We got to sing that unto each other to keep on reminding ourselves that God is good. Yes, he's good all, all the time. And how do, how do I seek him? And how do I seek the church? I think we are mad with the church most of the time. We are mad with the church as the body. And we're going to another church looking for what we didn't find at that other church. I think you are right, it's in us. And I think going to the rock of my salvation, going to the rock of my salvation. This is a stone that the builders rejected. I think we got to go to the rock of our salvation. And that, I think that's what he's doing. I think that's the question you asked, where should I go? In the end, yeah, where can I go? I'll go to the rock. Okay. Uh, Patricia, I think uh, practically speaking, understanding ourselves um, and historically uh, uh, women and women of, of color, you know, um, have, have not been uh, able in a, in, a sen in a sense to self-care, take care of themselves and learn how to do that. We, that's, that's something that we have to begin to learn how to do yes. and to, uh, to take care of ourselves. And, and we have to learn it from others. And that's what discipleship it is all about, learning it from those who, who have that skill set. Um, to, to teach us because our mothers didn't have that, you know, um, because all they did was was work and and um and and take care of everyone. So um and 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 you have we have to uh, break that cycle for your daughters. If you are a passive person and you are asking yourself, uh, and you've gotten to the point where you're asking the question, am I too passive? Then you probably are. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Okay, keep it going. Uh, here, uh, Frank, your hand has been up. Uh, yeah, I just had a, a quick comment with our question about like uh, boundaries, because that was something I was asking my a counselor not too long ago of like, as a believer, how do you establish boundaries and, and stuff? And, and in short, um, and I'm not saying like this is the exact answer, but this is just kind of what he uh, fed with me, uh, fed to me was um, um, there's a difference between boundary, boundaries and, and barriers. And if we learn what our uh, boundaries are, and sometimes we have to kind of learn them, you know, uh, uh, through like a hard kind of uh, situation, we then communicate what those boundaries are to the people that we're interacting with or the people that we are sharing life with or love or whatever. And then um, that helps us not create barriers because barriers is like, okay, somebody did me wrong, I'm cutting them off completely, they're done. Boom. And a lot of the times uh, that comes from not uh, effectively communicating what bound what your boundaries are. And so they can learn what those are, respect those and vice versa. That's a real short way to say it. it's a lot more, but I know we at the end, but that's kind of essentially what you're saying. That's good. Right? If, if you continue my word, then you are my disciples indeed. Seek, seek. If you continue in my word, then you're my disciples indeed. And, and read those scriptures, internalize them, you know, that, that God love you. And he told me to continue seeking his love. I think, and collectively and individually, and know that is the theme. And the hardest thing is meditate on the Lord day and night. That's saying it over again to me. Music is one of the best ways to keep memory going memory is the best is working because you're working you're you're cooking something you're welling something you're doing something and 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 and, and so that those kind of scriptures that should engulf i god knows all about my troubles amen sherlyn yeah. 
uh, your hand is up. I just had a, a thought about this question about boundaries because I've been taught that having boundaries is inappropriate in the church. And, and so I've struggled with that question. And, and recently I've been examining with the Lord, why do I cover abusers? Like, what is it that I feel like I have to protect, you know, people who abused, even to where if I know abuse is going on in a Christian community, I left. You know, I felt like I couldn't do anything. And so I just wanted to put in that mix with boundaries. How do we, I don't know if it's an answer, but balancing that with how do I love myself? Because I'm supposed to do that. But then also, how do we love the community? I've been reading a book or listening to a book about the other half of church, and it has to do with the loving community that's safe for discipleship. So when you're talking about discipleship, and healthy boundaries, when do we engage in love and in truth and humility where people or systems or authorities are violating boundaries and hurting people? And so that's the next place of the, the question, I guess, I'm wrestling with. When does the community you're wrestling with come into what is pain? You're wrestling with what is pain. Pain is a virtue. Pain is to remind you of to remind you. Pain is to remind you of to remind you in life. So, so music, count it all joy when you fall into all kinds of trials. For we know all things work together for good, for them that love God, love God, and them who are called according to his purpose. God done laid some foundation around us. And I, I think we got to look for them. We got to be looking for them in prayer. We got to be listening for them in prayer. You got to say, wash me, Lord. We got to say, Sister Rosa the Thurm, forgive me, Lord. Try me one more time. I be yours, dear Lord, if you be mine. When I stumble, when I sin, take me back, Lord, and try me again. Forgive me, Lord. It's that kind of rhythm of joy. It's that kind of rhythm of what we heard this morning. We need sure. to. Sure, need is, to that, is that a good source? Did that address, uh, did, did he um, sort of meet? Okay. All right. Um, Joanne, uh, how are you doing, Joanne? Good to see you. Um, you can unmute yourself. Uh, you, had, you had a question. Good morning. No, I was just going to speak to um, the situation about boundaries. First of all, I thought that was such a great reminder for me, like um, our teacher today, dealing with conflict, um, is, you know, how you approach it. What is is it really love or are you fighting for yourself? And, and um, it just helped me to remind me of several situations that I'm involved in. You know, it's always the goal is to come together somewhere as Christians, we shouldn't have this, like this, like war going on. Um, but anyway, to to uh, the boundaries, um, that's something I struggled with a lot. And you know, we see Christ in the temple, uh, you know, thrashing out the money changers. He he saw injustice, he saw wrong, and he always spoke up. And of course, he was Christ, and he could always do it perfectly. He knew when to crack the whip, and he knew when to. Um, reach into person's life and, and, and you say, forgive and minister to them. Um, but I recently had a situation, um, I'm involved with a, a service around here that um, when people are in crisis and they need somebody to take care of their, their child, uh, so they don't have to go into DCYF or say they're um, an immigrant and they don't know anybody here. So one had a baby and another one had to go in for a, um, a kidney thing. Um, so both families I've kept in touch with over the years and one of them, um, just got thrown out of her apartment and she reached out to me to come live with me. And, um, I've brought her to church several times and, um, and she's very hard, very hard person, kind of a street person, you know, has a lot of street smarts and lived on the streets. And I felt for her and her daughter, but I, I really it broke me to tell her no. 
so I can't take you into my house. I've got three empty bedrooms upstairs, but I felt that I couldn't bring her into my house and handle her situation. It would overwhelm me. Um, and then so I saw as a multitude of counsel, I saw, saw a social worker, a Christian social worker asked her the same thing. She said, no, that's definitely a place where you can put your boundary. Um, then the other situation, the other folks um, who I had ministered to, I just felt the Lord just, you know, asked me to bless them in a certain way. And I did. And, and it was a sacrifice. Uh, but my, I guess what I'm saying is um, there are people, the Bible says as much as it lies within you, live at peace with all men. There are people who you, you know, you do as much as you can. And it could even be a sacrifice on your part, but it doesn't, I think, put your life or like um, the woman who spoke, your children, you have children, their life in any kind of upheaval. Very rarely, I think God does call us to something like that that stretches us. But for the most part, like you're talking about self-care, so keep that nest and keep your nest up here at peace and, and uh, not involved in things that just kind of overthrow your physical life and your spiritual life. Again, there's times where, yes, where God stretches you, but you, I think you need advice to reach out in those places. I couldn't have not taken that woman into my house and her daughter and managed it. I don't have the skills. I don't have the, I didn't have, God didn't call me to it. Yeah, right. There's a balance. Yes. Yeah. Um, You've got your hand up for a while. Um, I, this is just a short observation to about boundaries. That it's always comforting to me to remember that we don't go through anything that Jesus himself didn't go through and feel. And there are examples in scripture of when Jesus had to get away. He, I, I think I, I was at the Sermon on the Mount. I, at some time, at one point, he was speaking to crowds. And he had to get away. He got in the boat and went across the lake to get away, I believe. And, and then there were other times when he knew that this was not his time when, when the crowds uh, turned against him and tried to kill him. Jesus had to slip away and get away. So he had to listen to the Father, too, to know when he had reached the boundaries, when he had reached his own limit. Um, and so, of course, there are, are plenty of wise people, good Christian people who are professionals in talking about how to set your boundaries. Um, but to me, it's also, also helpful uh, to always remember that, that we don't go through anything that Jesus didn't go through, too. And we just we have to seek the Father to know when it's time for us to get away for, um, for his kingdom to be advanced. We can't. We can't just lay ourselves down in, in total sacrifice if, if it's not time to do that. There are times to do that, but Jesus showed us that's not all the time. Yes. Well said, well said Chip. That's powerful. All um, of this is powerful. And we don't have all the time to, to discuss it, but I think we opening these thoughts with ourselves and, 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 and yeah, that was so powerful. The right. so pointed, thoughtful. That's what make a Bible class a Bible class. You you got to affirm the dignity of everybody that's on the line. That makes it difficult. It makes it meaningful. And how do we uh, how do we do that? You know, how do we do that at, with the limits? that we got set here for, for an hour and a half. We got that sort of a less, we got that set. This is beautiful. This is powerful when you can do this. Yes. This is beautiful when people can love each other enough to share our pain, our flaws, because we're looking to please God, you know? So, and, and we have to respect 
all of each other, but give all of each other the opportunity to hear each other. This is so beautiful. And that's what we want to be. That's what we want to be. That's hard to talk to people like that. But if, mm. but if, if, if we respect them and listen carefully, boy, we can get somewhere. Mm. We can get somewhere. I'm just so thankful that this Bible class has been. I'm so thankful for my life that has been. And I'm so thankful for all of y'all out there. And I just wish that somehow, even after I'm gone, not long, that y'all could continue. Well, you'll, you'll see us from heaven. And you're looking down, you'll see us uh, still having Bible study. Uh, yeah. Okay, I see. You. I see. You. But 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 the ability. What I was done here, the ability to listen to each other. That's the and and the ability to connect the theme together. You know what I mean? And that we don't go too far off the theme. Y'all was on theme. We was on theme. Is is knowing ourselves and being aware of God speaking to us. And God is always speaking. He's going from door to door, person to person. He's always asking and answering the question. I am the way. I am the truth. I am the lie. Those are great things when God summarizes himself before us. And, and a good Samaritan thought is one of the greatest thoughts in the Bible. Of course, the idea of God so loved the world is an opening thought. That's back in eternity. So we need to know, we need to hear you now, God. And, and, and while people can tell you, he also wants you to seek him so you can know when truth is happening. That's the beauty of a Bible class. That's the beauty of us who stay and intelligent, who believe each other, and don't create too big a contradiction. Don't create asking, asking people whether or not you pro-life or not is, is not something you ought to ask God. Uh, well, I want to- He might, um, he, he might okay. be, wait, wait a minute, I'm finished. He, he's trying to teach us God who at sundry time and divers manner spoke in time past to the Father by the prophet. That's all the past. But now, since Jesus has come, died, buried, rose again, and uh, life. So we, he's now speaking to us through the gospel. He's really speaking to us through the gospel. And the gospel is the solution to death. It's the continuation of life. It is love as the final fight. Are you following me? So this, we you, we need to be knowing what we are doing. And I think we are doing that this morning. I preach all, all of you. I wish we could keep on doing that and, and not be over captive by one person uh, dilemma. We pray for them. We encourage them. You know, but that don't take over the Bible class. And that's a big difficult task is keeping the Bible class centered on the theme we had for this morning. This has been beautiful. I'm finished. Amen. Amen. That, that was great. Um, Melinda, uh, you want to share the verse that you, you uh, shared in the chat? You were, yeah, I, I shared Psalm 16 and 6. And um, Psalm 16 and 6 says, uh, my boundary lines have fallen into pleasant places. <clears throat> and if you read the translation of that, it just says that boundaries are not to keep people out. It's not to build walls. It's just to keep us on that perfect path that the Father has for us. That even he himself says that, that I want to set boundaries for you and it's going to get you into the pleasant places that I have for you. Amen. What a wonderful study on on love and how uh, love is is a sentiment and it's not a sentiment; it's a commitment. And um, 
And uh, we want to take some time now and pray. And uh, and uh, Melinda, uh, would you um, lead us in a time of prayer and could, um, remember those who are uh, not here th today and uh, for our students on the campus of UVA and um, for uh, John and Vera May, their health and, and for um, uh, the ministry here at, at the Perkins Foundation. Um, are there any other prayer requests that we can um, pray for today? That is something in Virginia University. We have people that are on the campus. This, this is at another level. This was a, a black guy killing his roommates. His, this is something we need to be praying for our nation like we have never played for it before. Um, Linda and uh, uh, you and I ask you and um, to to start and Marsha can can end. Father, we just realized today that really the answer to all of this that's going on in, in Virginia in cities across America is love, because it's a sin problem, Father. It's a problem of not knowing you, Jesus, and the love of you. So, Father, we pray that God. We even pray, Lord, that. That Father, for those who are on the campus of Virginia, God, for, for all of those who even experienced secondary trauma, who witnessed things, who knew people, God, that were that would injure, who would kill God. We are just praying mm -hmm. for your mercy, your grace. And God, we find up the spirit of the violence in our schools, God, and on our campuses, God. And so, Lord, we just say today that we understand that love is the final fight. It's the beginning fight and it's the middle fight. And we realize also that you have positioned us in places so that we can be the armor bearers of love to you. You said to love our enemies, to love our friends, to do good to those who despitefully use us. The kingdom, God, the way that you have showed us is backwards. It doesn't make sense to love people who hurt us. It doesn't make sense to love people who are against us, but the kingdom of God flows out of something that's so different. So today for all of us on Bible study here, that God in one translation in 1 Corinthians, it says to hope unswervingly and to love lavishly, not just to love, but to love lavishly. So God, we pour that over us today as we prepare to leave wherever we are across the nation, around the world, that Father, we can't do it on our own. It takes the spirit of you to allow us to love the way that you want us to. But we submit ourselves and we die to ourselves so that we can truly love the way you want us to. Amen. Father, again, I just uh, thank you for our time together today. Lord, I thank you for the lesson on love, something that we as believers are supposed to be good at. Lord, help us yeah. to internalize this more, to be uh, the complete person to love completely. Uh, yes. Our families, our neighbors, uh, to love you more fully and more completely than we have already and uh, I thank you for that. Lord, um, I remember that one passage in, in Peter where it says they, that he wants them to overflow with love for one another, but to love completely and fully. And so, Lord, as we go about today, help us to see, open our yeah. eyes to see those ways, small and big, that we can love lavishly, that we can love fully yes. and completely the neighbor, the family, and the yes. Uh, God that we love and serve. In your name I pray. Amen. 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 And uh, I want to just remind you all that next week is a, a week of Thanksgiving and we won't be having Bible study next Tuesday. And uh, we'll, we'll uh, start back on November 29th with part two of our Faith, Hope, and Love uh, series. And uh, our guest will be Pastor Matt McGew. And uh, uh, he's been here uh, before and he's been in our, our Bible study. So um, Pastor uh, Dr. Vander Ark, uh, the other, the uh, Dr. V number one, uh, would you give us a closing benediction today? 
I love you. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine on you and be gracious to you. May the Lord turn his face toward you and give you peace. Amen. 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 And, uh, and remember, you guys, go this week and give love because the only love you keep is the love you give away. God bless you all. Have a great week. Bye. Bye. Thanks. Bye.